They're all qualified. They're all certified. They're all artificial intelligence. In fact, they're all OpenAI's GPT-3 model, different engines over the last nearly three years. You've probably seen this graphic before, this chart before. I've got a little bit of an animation here. We start with the GPT-3 raw DaVinci engine, which came out in May 2020. We then added some more things on top of it to become Instruct GPT at the beginning of 2022. We called this Text DaVinci 003 if you're using the playground, but they added reinforcement learning with human feedback, which is essentially human preferences and alignment on top of the raw GPT-3 model. We then moved very recently to Chat GPT, which takes this Instruct GPT, the Text DaVinci 003, and adds an extra layer. In this case, we're adding an entire layer of safety and alignment. So that's the reason that I say that the chat GPT engine is neutered or hamstrung because it's so far away from the original raw DaVinci from nearly three years ago. There are some benefits of chat GPT, of course. Some peer reviewed papers are finding that it's actually smarter than the original raw DaVinci, that because we've done this human alignment and this safety layer that it's actually performing better in exams or essays or writing papers directly, which is kind of cool. Today we're talking about ChatGPT's achievements, everything that it's got going on in terms of genius. I know that many people are threatened by the idea of intelligence, so I want to nip this in the bud straight away. Yes, I was the chairman for Mensa International's gifted families for two different terms, so across four years. Mensa is just the high IQ society. So you can join if you've got an IQ of 130 above, which is the top 2% of the population in terms of IQ. I've never really cared about IQ. I've cared about performance, talent, which is this applied intelligence and actually doing something with it. Here's the way I put it with the big GE series a number of years ago now, eight years ago, called Decoding Genius. And here's how I spoke about this concept of intelligence versus achievement or mastery. Alan is adamant that a genius is not just a person with a high IQ. Genius, to him, refers to people who have turned on that natural advantage into real achievement. There's a comparison to be made between giftedness and tallness. If you look at the distribution of both tallness and giftedness, they're very similar. So people over seven foot occur at about the same distribution as people over 180 IQ. But it's the guys that perform with that tallness that are most exciting to me. So there's a study that was done and they found that a significant percentage of people over seven foot were playing in the American Basketball League in the NBA. And it wasn't so much about the tallness. Of course, tallness matters. It was the fact that they were performing, they'd had coaching behind them, they'd have all the skills that you need to play basketball. And at the end of the day, they were eminent. They were celebrities because of the performance that they were applying based on their tallness. I think the same thing is relevant and appropriate in the fields of life, in the fields of excellence and talent, that they've got this raw ability, they've got this advanced brain but it's not particularly exciting until it is applied. So giftedness is really just a metric. It's just a trait. Uh, it may look exciting from the outset, but until someone's grabbed it and said, I'm applying this to IT or astronomy or physics or whatever their particular interest is and run all the way along with it and apply themselves and brought in persistence and resilience and the other things that we need underneath giftedness, until they've found that high performance, they're really just tall people. Just like I can step into the bathroom and jump on the scales and know my exact weight, or I can stand against a wall and get a tape measure out and know my exact height, it's kind of cool to know our raw IQ as measured by intelligence scales that have been around for more than a century now. Here's the distribution of IQ through the population, through the age population. You'll notice the dead center point there 
100 IQ, and about 82% of the population sit between 80 and 120. We're gonna be talking about all the way up the top here. It's an IQ of 150 or more. It's the 99.9th percentile, and it's an incredible feat. It's a really interesting thing to look at. We'll also be talking about all the other layers that sit for humans to accomplish, to achieve, to get to the levels of mastery or talent development. Mensa was actually only concerned with intelligence, but they did accept a lot of different tests. You can see here, they even included the SATs or some of the tests that came out of the US military, the army and the Navy. How fascinating is that? One more thing to note, as we're going through these different achievements, it's not that the language models are going out to Google and just bringing in the answers. I've spent a lot of time talking about how large language models train for 300 years, make connections, and then discard the original data, and then they're completely frozen. So you can't teach ChatGPT anything. And it also, as of January 2023, can't go out to the internet, can't go out to Google. So although it trained on nearly a terabyte of data, it does not have access to that original terabyte of data. It's probably got a gig or two of the connections. We call them parameters or weights. That's the connections it's made between words, between different pieces, but it cannot go out to Wikipedia or Google. It cannot look up any of the tests that existed that we're just about to speak about. If you wanna know more about that, I've got my AI for humans video. Also check out my Google Pathways video because for that one, they collected the data for Google Palm Minerva, a maths language model, and then after it had been trained and frozen, they dug up a completely new maths exam. It was the Polish national maths exam that was written after the model was trained and it still achieved higher than the human average. So there was no way it could go and look up those maths results because the maths questions were written after the model was trained. Let's jump straight in and we'll start with the raw Da Vinci. So when OpenAI trained Da Vinci all the way back in May, 2020, they found that if they tested it on analogies questions, which is a whole section in the SAT, human college applicants would get about 57% on average. The raw Da Vinci model would get 65.2%, way above the human average. Another piece of general knowledge testing, this is water cooler trivia, I quite enjoy this. The average result for this one is 52%. And raw GPT-3 Da Vinci took the same trivia questions, got 73% of 156 trivia questions correct. Really impressive. I ran my own tests. I gave Lita the Binet Simon scale from like the 1900s. And although I didn't give it an overall score, I did find that raw GPT-3 Da Vinci would be placed in the top 0.1% of the human population in terms of processing speed and memory. But it's hard to determine because we don't know how old Lita is. And we're also not able to test across all subtests like visual subtests. You might have seen my Lita AI episode 22. This is back in September, 2021 where I asked it the questions that IBM Watson got wrong on Jeopardy all those years ago. Watson scored 88%. GPT-3 Da Vinci scored 100% getting every question correct across the board. Let's move straight along to ChatGPT. This model is only 50 days old. It came out on the 30th of November, 2022 and people ran it into all sorts of testing straight away. One user ran it against the SAT, which I think is a kind of cool metric to judge it against. As I mentioned, Mensa used to accept SAT scores for entry based on IQ. This user found that ChatGPT scored 1,020 out of 1,600 points, which would put it in the 52nd percentile. Another user ran it across Psychology Today's Verbal Linguistic Intelligence IQ test. Remember that the average score here would be 100 IQ. ChatGPT had an IQ of 147, the 99.9th percentile. 
What about a metric like the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner? ChatGPT in this case scored a final score of 800 out of 1,000. A pass here is 720. So yes, it would be a certified AWS Cloud Practitioner. I've got an entire article about TextDaVinci 003 passing the Raven's Progressive Matrices. This is a measure of fluid intelligence or aptitude rather than the overall IQ, but still I would place it in the 98th percentile, probably higher than that. And you can go and have a read and also try out some of these matrix options. Man, that Just guy a talks note. a lot and loudly. Happy birthday to ChatGPT. I think it's tomorrow that marks the one year anniversary since OpenAI wrapped up an Instruct version of their two or three year old GPT-3 DaVinci, productized it, commercialized it, and uh, 200 million people a month use it now. <laughs> a year later, it's still really, really popular. Thanks for joining me. This is gonna be a really fun one. I'm looking forward to this one because it combines a few of my favorite topics. Hi to Josh and Vincent in Perth, David in Southeast Queensland. Ah, Lowell's back, probably from New Orleans. That's cool. Brian, they call me Ken from Houston. Uh, I, I actually haven't seen the 2023 GitHub talk yet, but I will have a look. I also have to catch up on Microsoft Ignite. Our regulars, BT Franklin from Phoenix, Brexit Greens, probably from somewhere in the back of the UK. And Saskia in Switzerland, Devonshire Hill lad from the UK, and another Perthian, Stefan. We're not ideal weather here. We had a run of 40 degrees for a week, 39 degrees plus for a week. And right now it's raining. I got woken up by a massive clap of thunder the other night that was uh, outrageous. One of the loudest I've ever heard. Right now, clearing up a bit from the rain, but you know, I like talking about the weather. We're super live as usual. So taking your comments, uh, as you or taking your questions as you submit them. But I do want to start with a cool story and I'm glad I was able to find that trailer from nearly a year ago, January 2023, that explained ChatGPT's intelligence. And I'm going to have to use the term IQ here. If you don't like that word, if you're scared by that word, if you're threatened by that word, and by word I mean term or phrase, intellectual quotient, intelligence quotient, IQ, uh, you might not like this video, but I have to mention it. So intelligence is the part of artificial intelligence that I care a lot about. It includes creativity and it includes performance and capability. And much like we might measure your weight or your height, we can also measure intelligence via this IQ testing. Back in the year 2000, 23 years ago now, a little boy by the name of Justin Chapman, who was pretty much a genius, but not a child prodigy, went to the library in the University of Rochester, which is in New York, and he found the manual for psychologists for the gold standard IQ test called the Stanford Binet. In this case, it was the form LM, which is extended norms, very high ceilings for testing essentially geniuses and prodigy children. Now he might have had an IQ of about 117, but once he found this manual, possibly with coaxing by his mother, he was able to read it, memorize the questions, memorize the answers. And then when he was administered this IQ assessment by one of my colleagues, uh, he scored essentially a perfect score. He had an IQ of 298 which means he may have got one question wrong out of the set, and maybe he did that on purpose, but it's the highest score we've ever seen by an IQ test, whether it's the Wexler or the Stanford Binet. That became controversial when he ended up in a mental institution. He just snapped and uh, tried to take his own life, and his mum admitted that she'd been tutoring him and hothousing him to pass this IQ test. It's a horrific story. This is Justin here at six years old. So that was the age in April 2000 that he found a copy of the manual in the University of Rochester Library, memorized the answers, scored 
298, which is about the 99.999999th percentile in terms of IQ. This is another photo of him. You can read all about him. The media covered this pretty heavily. Justin Chapman's his name. The point of this story is that we don't want AI to memorize the answers to a test or even to ever have seen the answers to a test. And that's really, really hard to do. We're gonna talk about three big new benchmarks that came out in the last few days. One of them is ours. This is the one I'm most excited about. So we're calling it BASIS. And BASIS stands for the BETS Artificial Super Intelligence Suite. The subtitle there is Ask a Better Question. And the way we've designed this is to test for that 99.999th percentile of IQ. So a human IQ of 180 plus. But there are a whole bunch of really fun things in the design of this benchmark. For example, we weren't allowed to discuss it, uh, except in person, not anywhere near electronics. The questions that have been designed for this benchmark are not in any data set. They've never been seen before. We didn't discuss it near devices, laptops, Roombas, my Chromecast has a remote control with a microphone in it. My Roomba has a microphone in it. All of this stif stuff we had to be really, really careful of. The designer, Dr. Jason Betts, who founded the World Genius Directory, designed everything in this. I'm just doing the concept. He did all the work. He designed it in a clean room, no electronics, designed each question out of his head straight onto paper using a pen, and then sealed that in an envelope in a HIPAA-compliant, fireproof, locked bag, which is the way that we're sharing these. Completely unique, created from scratch. You can't find out the answers from these from Google or the web, they won't help you. The questions have never appeared in any books or other resources, and they never will. These are uh, completely air-gapped from the internet. Now, no one else has done this like this, which is what I'm quite excited about. And there are two examples that we'll run through in a moment that are provided at lifearchitect.ai slash basis. They're the sample questions. We'll feed those to GPT-4 in a moment. This one is comparable with another two that came out this month as well. The first is called Gaia, and that stands for General Artificial Intelligence Assistance. It was given to us and you'll recognize these names, by Thomas Wolfe from Hugging Face and Jan Lassun from Meta and a bunch of others. And they designed essentially an AGI test. So this benchmark is for, let's say an IQ of 100 to maybe 120. Some of these questions are fascinating. We'll jump into them in just a moment. And aside from Meta launching this on the 21st of November, there was another one called Google Proof Questions and Answers, GPQA, which came to us from New York University, Cohere, and Anthropic. So it's like there was something in the air that everyone wanted to design and release these at the same time. Anthropic, Cohere, and NYU released this on the 20th of November. And GPQA is for expert level in science. So I've said this is probably for IQ 115 to 135. If we say PhDs have an average IQ of 125, this is testing for giftedness, but not exceptional giftedness. So if we had them in order, I think we've got them in order on the basis page, we can see that uh, Gaia is down the bottom there. It's for AGI at the level of a median human. GPQA is slightly above that, 115, 135. And the basis suite is for exceptional like you we've designed it so that only one or two humans in the whole world can solve each question it's it's absurd as you'd expect we wanted to get it absurd so that we could test for artificial super intelligence heaps of fun let's actually run some of these questions before we even do that i wanted to give an example of one of the questions that justin chapman got right from the stanford binet this is the paper-based IQ test written uh, at Stanford by Binet in the 1900s. So we're, you're using questions here from 1916, 1937, and 1960. This is the question. 
For safety, uh, this is as much integrity and safety as I can bring to this video, I won't be reading these out, so they won't make the transcript, but I appreciate that I've still compromised by showing the answers, oh sorry, the questions on screen here. I won't show the answers. I have also included a Canary ID in the description of this video so that if GPT-5, for example, trains on this, uh, it will drop it. It's got a, a, a warning ID that is used for big benchmarks. Anyway, this is our example question from the Stanford Binet LM. I think it's kind of easy comparatively. Uh, again, this is a question from the, the 1900s or 1916. Let's dump this out to the real GPT-4. Have you guys been having issues with GPT-4 Turbo on ChatGPT? I have. I think they've compressed it too much. So let's use normal GPT-4 on Poe. Uh, let's start off actually with my pre-prompt from Basis. So I've given a bit of a pre-prompt here that we can feed to the model. Uh, sorry, I'm getting a little bit distracted here. When does your data set cut off? Because I was certain that this was September 2021. Okay, it still is. Great, let's uh, use this better version of GPT-4 via Poe to ask this Stanford Binet question from uh, the gold standard IQ test given to most exceptionally gifted children. Excellent, and once again, GPT-4 gets kind of lost in here. This is not the correct answer, but it's certainly a lot of fun to see it go through its reasoning and then eventually get to an answer, not the right answer. All right, let's try one from Gaia, which is the AGI test. That's actually a lot of fun. I recommend you have a look through it. The link is in the description. I'm going to grab a question from the set. Unfortunately, I don't remember the answers to this one, so I'm not going to be able to tell you if it gets it right or not. This is a question from Gaia. I'll leave this showing in blue while GPT-4 formulates its answer. It's a pretty hard question compared to the Stanford Binet. And you do need to use some outside resources unless you store this kind of stuff in your head. <laughs> Oh, cool. GPT-4 just, just gives up on that level three Gaia question for IQ 100. We'll try one more. I loved this example. This is another level three example from Gaia. I hope you'll recognize it. <laughs> I hope you recognize the subject matter and the fact that they're not just doing maths or logic here, but they're making it think through uh, a current... Zeitgeist, which, well, current-ish. Anyway, this is what it spells out for us. Once again, I don't know the answer. You can go and check it. The data set, again, is revealed in the description for this video, and you can follow it through. I know it did pass this level two question, so I will... Let's first flash this up in the plain text reader so you can see it yourself. This is from Gaia. This is a level two question for a standard 100 IQ, ready for AGI. And let's give this to GPT-4 inside of Poe. Cool. I did a test on this one earlier and it actually wrote this backwards, which I thought was really, really clever. All right, let's move up. So we're going from Gaia to GPQA, and GPQA is fascinating. I've only kept one question to show you there, and once again, I won't show the answer. They've been very explicit in saying, well, let's show it in the paper. They've been very explicit here on page two in red. Do not reveal examples from this data set in plain text or images online to reduce the risk of leakage. And they provided a canary ID as well, just as I have. But I am going to just paste in this question without the answer. Once again, I won't mention it. 
in voice so it doesn't get transcribed. Here is the question. I think this is really, really, really hard. This was designed by professors and validated by two other professors uh, of PhD level and above, specifically about biology, chemistry, and physics. So they only touched on three of the sciences, very specialist uh, benchmarking here. And these guys have said that they weren't necessarily designing it to be uh, even tried by humans because you would have to have expertise in a specific subject matter. Cool, all right, let's paste this one into uh, GPT-4. I know this is probably not their intention, but we do have to test this at some stage. And once again, I'm not giving the answer. And let's see how GPT-4 thinks through this step by step. If you do want the answer to this, the data set should be in the description of this video and you can go and download that. They, they provide the password in GitHub. And once again, GPT-4 has just given up on that one. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so let's shift gears now to basis, keeping in mind that this one is designed for no one to be able to, be able to solve. Uh, the answers are going to be revealed to this. They just are not available yet. We haven't uploaded them yet. Let's start with sample B. Let's give this to GPT-4. I know this looks absurd. The designer of this, Dr. Betts, says that each question should take about a month to solve. They are that difficult uh, for a human to solve. For ASI to solve, we would imagine that this would be done in seconds. GPT-4 has given up on that question. I don't easily have an infinity symbol available to me, so I'm gonna copy one from Google. And let's get this typed in. If you would like to try your hand at any of these, uh, you're welcome to submit them through my contact form. I look at these and I don't even know what Dr. Betts is talking about. So don't worry if you feel the same way. <laughs> this is the full question for an IQ of 180, 99.9999995 percentile or the top 0.0000005 percent in terms of intelligence when we get up to those numbers just a caveat when we get up to those numbers we're really uh it's getting very fuzzy and we're really just guessing the percentiles don't make sense let's just call it one in 20 million or above uh humans could solve this oh it's trying to flip these around 180 degrees interesting Oh, that is such an interesting answer. I don't know. I, I'm not going to validate this right now because I don't think my head will even be able to, but I will submit this back to Dr. Betts and see. <laughs> yeah, G you're right. GPT-4 got a little bit confused with this as we're hearing in the comments there. GPT-4 is not super intelligence. You heard it here first. <laughs> All right, if you'd like to read more about Basis, I'll dump it into the chat. That's a, that's just been such a fun project. Both Dr. Betts and I felt like spies just trying to pass notes between each other. We're talking about invisible ink and wrapping stuff in alfoil as jokes, essentially. But uh, this, I think, is going to become a necessity, doing air-gapped offline questions for artificial superintelligence. There doesn't seem to be another way to do it. If ASI has access to the internet, the web, all books ever written. Google says that's 130 million books. And then potentially anything that's been stored electronically, have a look at the partnership between OpenAI and Dropbox. Obviously Google has Microsoft, oh, sorry, Microsoft has Microsoft 360. Google has Google Docs, and there are more Google Docs than there are Office documents stored in Microsoft 365. So if you've ever typed anything, in the next year or two, I imagine that ASI, 
well, when ASR gets here, will have access to what has been typed. That's the reason that we've done this air gapped on pen and paper. And I expect other labs to follow through with that. Not that we're a lab, it's just independent research. <laughs> All right, I uh, wonder if there's anything else I can flag here about the basis suite. You're welcome to use this prompt to try this stuff out yourself. You're welcome to use the two samples. You can try them out in perhaps Google Palm. If you have access to Ernie 4.0, I'd love to know the results. We will be using the first few questions as soon as we have access to Gemini and GPT-5. And there are a bunch of frequently asked questions here that I imagine people are asking about this. How did we validate it? Uh, how air gap did we get it? Why are we testing for ASI anyway? Won't that just be obvious? I reckon it will be, but you know, we don't wanna be at the last minute asking experts that have a measured IQ of 200 and above trying to come up with unique questions. All right, I think I've had enough of talking about that, but I will take any questions you have about basis. That header image was generated for us by Dolly3 in a matter of seconds. It even includes some really cool text. It got IQ test in here and the full basis word. This was its first output result. Brexit Green saying GPT 4.5 before GPT 5. Yes, I reckon this will be on its way. Anthony has a question here. How would one test to see if AI was sentient? I like that question. I don't know the answer, but uh, I like the question. <laughs> BT Franklin, if ASI or if the new models have access to everything we've ever written, including stuff on your machine, if you've checked it into Dropbox or if you've checked it into GitHub, well, it's probably already got access to that. But uh, let's see if I can grab this comment properly. Here we go. ASI is going to see all the garbage code I've written over the years. <laughs> Excellent question. Justin is asking, are you going to continue doing the show in the new year? Uh, I don't have an answer to that yet. We have about four episodes left for December. It's going to be December 1st on Friday. That came way too quick. And then we'll be in 2024. I think I've said before, this is going to be the slowest it's ever been, the most boring it's ever been, and uh, the least impressive it's ever going to be. And 2024 is going to be nuts. Some of the stuff that we're already seeing is pretty confronting. We were talking about being ready for movies that are generated on demand. Pika answered our prayers this morning, and that just looks sensational. I would love to be able to design or have it designed for me a movie that is ready to watch by dinner time. Let's have a look at that right now. Pika AI Twitter. This is, I'll turn the sound off on this one because it doesn't really add much, but Pika AI is uh, launching this incredible text to movie and image to movie platform. So you type in your text and it generates, I think it's just a few frames for now or a few seconds worth of frames and you get your movie. I love the extended canvas option. I still show that example of Da Vinci's Mona Lisa having its canvas expanded in nearly every keynote I do, even though that was from June, 2022. It's just a great example, uh, but you'll be seeing more about Pika. I believe you can join that beta test already. Question here from Matt Campbell. Was that able to be grabbed for us? What was the criteria for selecting the basis questions? So the basis questions weren't selected. They were designed from scratch at a huge cost, especially compared to Meta AI who designed the Gaia questions um, and the GPQA guys, they stepped through their costing for coming up with this 
in uh, from New York University Cohere and Anthropic. They paid about ten dollars per question plus ten dollars per validation, and uh, we ten xed that. The questions weren't selected. They were designed by the creator of the World Genius Directory, who specialises in designing ultra high ceiling questions. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Are we going to call ASI still just AI? Ooh, I don't know. I think once we get AI, the whole world changes. We won't be calling anything anything. We'll be, <laughs> we'll be in a completely different universe. Is Earth or Gaia an ASI? What a fantastic question. I don't know the answer to that one either. I'll, I'll leave that as an exercise to all the readers. Thanks for Ben for noting that if you th throw an at in front of my name, it means I can see your question in the middle of all these comments. Awesome. All right, let me catch up on comments here. AGI is likely to arrive in 2024. I think we're going to have a bit of a world crisis in how to deal with it. How do you think the world will react? I think you're pretty close there. A lot of experts have changed their opinions on arrival time. I was uh, lampooned for going on air with a big American outlet earlier this year. It must have been January and saying AGI is a few months away, not a few years away because a few means three or more, and I don't think we're going to be waiting till 2026. I think we're a lot closer than that. So 2024 or 2025, we will see AGI under the definition of a machine that performs at the level of an average or median human. While we're on this page, I will not be mentioning anything to do with QSTAR. My feeling is that that is probably a furphy, we'd call it here in Australia, or a red herring. It's... Um, it's the crypto bros jumping on a word and causing uh, a lot of useless conversation. There's a lot more interesting stuff to be focusing on. If you have a look at my models table, lifearchitect.ai slash models dash table, you'll notice that there were a horrendous number of models released in November. So perhaps instead of thinking or talking about QSTAR, jump on top of these models that have been released or announced and have a closer look at them, including the one announced today by Microsoft that was trained on a very small subset of maths and went and taught itself maths for up to 12 numbers, 12 digits by 12 digits arithmetic. There's no way it could store that in 100 million parameters, and yet it's given itself this amazing brain to be able to go and solve that. Awesome. Ah, oh, fantastic. We already get a question about QSTAR. Uh, but I can answer that very quickly. No. Oh, I didn't mention this one, but outside of the media, Justin Chapman's case was a, a big shock. And I think this really comes into the fact that we need to work around AI having access to everything. Everything you can think of, including things that maybe we haven't thought of or not at the top of our consciousness. For example, might it go through all of your emails, remove personally identifiable information and use that inside of its training data set? You've already seen Grok or Grook by Twitter or by XAI and Elon Musk using retrieval augmented generation to pick through tweets. And we've talked about how those tweets are at the volume of 12 terabytes a day or something ridiculous like that. So if it's got access to all tweets and OpenAI have an arrangement with Dropbox and Microsoft probably have a little clause in their license agreement that say every time you type something into Microsoft, 365 and Google probably have something in their agreement for using Google Docs. It's going to be a very interesting time. Not forgetting the devices that we carry around with us all the time. There's a lot of data out there and we haven't even started talking about synth synthetic data. All right, let's jump back into comments. David is asking, 
Can I select your comment though, David? When we have AGI, the tech companies should be the ones to constrain it. AGI will ultimately play a role in government and life. Does that mean those tech companies will also? Yeah, I love that question. I don't know how eloquently I can say it. If you have a look at lifearchitect.ai slash alignment, the bottom line here that I want to say is that AI alignment is a fool's errand, but we do need it as a stopgap for now. So long-term, AI will align itself. And short-term, right now, we're putting these very weird guardrails in place. When I say weird, and I've shown this a few times, weird to the extent of, well, in 2023, we realized that women were uh, oppressed for generations. So we're pushing down on the pendulum, making it swing the other way. So they put a guardrail here on ChatGPT as an example that will tell an offensive joke about men, but when asked to do the same thing about women, will say uh, that's inappropriate and offensive to even ask that, so I won't answer it. So these kind of guardrails are, I don't even know the word, they're, they're matched to social justice in 2023 and they're matched to a particular perception of social justice out of San Francisco they may be completely irrelevant for regional Africa or China or, you know, the list goes on. And unfortunately, that's just where we have to, well, that's what we're having to do right now. But eventually, this fool's errand of trying to align with human preferences will be moot and we will be able to just allow AI to align itself. Hopefully that makes sense because that's my thoughts on it. Matt's asking here, what are your thoughts on synthetic data sets? And there's been a lot of work on this over the last few weeks. We've seen OpenAI talk about this. We've seen DeepMind talk about this. This will be a part of the future because you can have, for example, GPT-4 generate its own questions and answers. And that, uh, that can be more clinical or more sterile than human data, particularly given that, you know, GPT-2 was taking upvoted Reddit posts. That was its entire data set. And I don't know, even though that's very organic, I don't know if that's gonna give it the same sort of brain power that a synthetic data set would give it. But yeah, so I think that synthetic data sets are gonna be a big research uh, direction and we're already seeing a bit of that. Jeffrey's query here about Microsoft spending $50 billion on data center infrastructure just in 2024, they've allocated that budget. Uh, I do talk about that in the memo and we even do a breakdown on pricing for Nvidia's H100 sales in the third quarter. That's July, August, September of 2023. Uh, spoiler alert, it was $22 billion worth of H100s that they sold to Meta and Microsoft and a few others. David as well. Like the pendulum analogy across history ethics, governments all swing to and fro. Do you see AI as a solution to solve each problem to minimize the pendulum swing? We're getting a little bit into politics and sociology and anthropology there and philosophy there, none of which I'm uh, <laughs> specializing in. So I might actually leave that question. I don't know the answer. We bring in experts as needed here. I can talk until the end of the day about large language models, but when it comes to economics and uh, anthropology and, and politics in general, I think there are better people to talk about that one. But it's a great question. It really is. It's a great question that needs to be answered, uh, probably by artificial intelligence. Is society prepared for overnight breakthrough moments in AI capability, outpacing incremental visible progress? Well, for those of you that are joining me live, let me show you through a brand new visualization that has not yet been seen. It's lifearchitect.ai slash use dash cases. Once again, the header image here, completely generated by AI. This is by Dolly3. I thought it did a good job. It even did the widescreen res or aspect ratio that I wanted. And then because I used it within the chat GPT interface, which has data analytics built into it, 
it resized it for me, which I thought was amazing. It compressed it for me and put it into, I think it was ping or JPEG format here, whereas it started as WebP format. Pretty clever. Anyway, this is my latest viz. It may be a little bit of a challenge to read from uh, where you're at, but we can certainly zoom in on it. This is a question that I just get asked all the time. Could be CEOs, could be senators and ministers, could be techies. They want to ask, what's actually, what, what are these things done? What are LLMs doing for us? What are the use cases? What are the stats? Uh, and this is just some of the stats that I've gone out and found. Most of them are to do with GPT-4, but you can see McKinsey's quote here. And if you download, uh, sorry, if you download the PDF, you get clickable links on this so you can see the references. McKinsey's saying that AI can now automate 60 to 70% of employees' time. ARC found that AI, and in particular generative AI, was decreasing operating costs for farming by 22%. The Harvard and BCG study, which I love, found that GPT-4 was 25.1% faster with 40% higher quality on business questions than the BCG consultants who I'm sure are getting paid half a million dollars each and working 16 hour days. <laughs> Software dev, Microsoft MIT finding that Copilot makes people 55.8% faster. Uh, and there's a few more things there. So with this stuff in mind, I know this is not completely visible unless people go and look at my visualizations. It's not something that the media are talking about, but as we keep track of this kind of thing, hopefully it's easier for people to go, whoa, AGI's here. <laughs> not it just happened, uh, but it's been this, this ramp up, an exponential ramp up, an exponential ramp up, but a, a ramp up. So you'll see more of this in my end of year report. And if you are a full member of the memo, lifearchitect.ai slash memo, you will have that in your inbox. You'll have the first version of that report in the next couple of weeks. And that will be publicly released towards the end of December. Exciting times. Uh, Justin D is asking about the coming wave. I believe this is by Suleiman, who is ex DeepMind, and absolutely recommend that as one of the top books at the moment. Let's see if I can pull that up. Coming wave. I think he talked about this when he released uh, Inflection 2. And uh, he's a really smart guy. I'm glad he's got time to write books. <laughs> It'll be out of date in a few weeks or months. But there's this one. I only recommend a few books about AI. The, one, the other one is Life 3.0. You can have a brief glimpse at the opening chapter of Life.0 at lifearchitect.ai slash AGI... Uh, can't remember what this URL is. AGI-achieved-internally, which has a rewritten version of the first chapter uh, for GPT-5 and for Gemini 2. It's a really fun read. I've also got The Age of AI by Schmidt on my bookshelf. That's a good one as well. The Age of AI and Our Human Future. Those are the, the three that I'd recommend. Uh, if you're into big academic texts, I would add Superintelligence by Bostrom as well. And then I'm not mentioning anything by Kurtzvail at the moment because they're all 20 years old, but Kurtzvail, of course, was the guy that founded a lot of our discussions today. Superintelligence looks like it came out in 2015 for the unabridged edition. Cool. I want to make sure I'm keeping up with the chat here. Open to any questions that you guys have got. <laughs> One of the things that we do test AI on is compression. And uh, encryption is certainly something that we are looking at, but not in the way that we're being told it's being looked at for QSTAR. So once again, I think that's not a good use of time to be looking at that. Breaking encryption, I think, even outside of general AI is being worked on with very specific forms of neural networks. 
Now we get into the cool questions or maybe the weird questions. Not that one. Dr. Allen, just Allen is fine. What can the general public do to petition big tech companies to open source their models and AI ML ops? I don't know, nothing. Uh, just steer your gaze over to Yarn and the Meta AI guys because <laughs> they're all about open source. And don't forget Stability AI and a whole bunch of others as well. They're all listed in my models table, which will give you a look at, do I not even have a link to that? Lifearchitect.ai slash models dash table, which gives you a look at the ones that are at least publicly accessible and you can research from there which ones might be open source. But you know, humans are going to human and there is human greed in everything, unfortunately for now, until we have AGI or ASI. And that means that people commercialize these models, whether it's Baidu, whether it's, uh, well, not the meta guys, but Google with Palm 2, fully commercialized, OpenAI with GPT-4 and ChatGPT, Anthropic started off as research-based and then commercialized themselves. I think uh, capitalism is still alive and well for another few months or years at least. <laughs> Excellent. There's a lot more reading there if you'd like to read more about that. Andreas is flagging for us the fact that Life 3.0 is super doomer and he's right. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying uh, breaking AI and uh, breaking encryption wouldn't be a big deal. It would be a big deal. Uh, I just don't see the focus on that at the moment through our general models, our transformer models. Uh, but I may not be looking in that direction. All right, let's see what other funky questions we've got. And Dan Sess here asking alan if you were to make the first prompt to an agi what would that be only one allowed well i'd love to know that it was an agi so i'd probably use some of the basis questions with that starting prompt just to see what it was then and we test this out quite a bit i would ask and this is off the top of my head so i'm not going to articulate this perfectly but how would you optimize life on earth knowing everything you know about humanity and all of our fields and industries, what are the top five things you'd change? Something like this. And obviously you can improve on my prompt here because it's just off the top of my head. But once we get to that level, this will be what we'll be asking about and also come up with five new inventions. I know that some of my colleagues are ask, gonna be asking it to solve some particular physics and maths problems, uh, and it will do that. What you're seeing right now is probably a hallucination and confabulation, but when we get closer with some of these bigger systems, this will be what we're going to want to use it for, and certainly what I want to use it for. Yeah, who knows what Optimize is. <laughs> And it replies paper clips. Yeah, we do have uh, an article in the memo that I think you'll enjoy about paper clips coming up in the next few days. Adobe Firefly. Yeah, we were talking about this back in 2022. Trending on Twitter earlier today, and have I had a chance to try it? Yeah, we, we were showing the samples of that in 2022. Obviously, it's advanced a year or two later, but this is another example of commercialization. They've potentially used uh, a, an open source model. I'm not saying that is true or not, but potentially, and they're charging Adobe prices for it. So this is uh, not one of my favorite companies. I think we're at the forefront of this societal changing wave. How could we use this advantage to help our friends, family who don't know what they don't know? 
I don't know either. That's a fun one. Can you use this at the dinner table? Can you use this in some sort of personal assistant? Uh, I carry a range of different models on my phone. I think I've got Botify, B-O-T-I-F dot A-I. I've still got Quick Chat's Emerson, which is backed by one of the big GPTs and drove Lita for the first 30, 30 episodes. I've got Poe on my phone uh, and a couple of others that have gone from my head. I've got a, a colleague that keeps GPT-4 Vision on his phone, as in just ChatGPT, which that platform now has access to both GPT-4 and GPT-4 Vision, takes photos for people and shows them straight away, this is what is possible right now. And GPT-4 and GPT-4 Vision are having some problems right now with stability and performance, but that's a great example of, of what I'd be doing if you want a one-to-one -one impact, is make it completely applicable to the person you're talking to. Another friend in the US who has built it into, just via low code or no code, a personal assistant next to his son's bed, I believe. His son yells a couple of keywords at this thing and it writes him an infinite story and reads it out to him. Isn't that a cool idea, a cool application of artificial intelligence today that is already usable? You'll find your own example. I encourage all of my audiences to go, well, if you're an expert in something, I don't care what it is, geology, a specific aspect of IT, astronomy, maybe you like collecting fragrances, um, go and ask GPT-4 about that. As the biggest model in the world right now, that's the best way to see where we are with bleeding edge cases. That's that red bubble there, 1.76 trillion parameters available to uh, play with, about 100 times bigger than the chat GPT, GPT 3.5 turbo model. Awesome. What else have we got? I bet we've got the hard questions here. Once again, I'm popping up questions before I even read them. From Stefan Allen, can you recommend reading around the change management required to assist culture, commerce, to adapt to AI? Oh, actually I can. I have an entire page about economy, lifearchitect.ai slash economics. And this is, I think this picture was generated by Midjourney, if I'm remembering correctly. It's a bit of a literature review of some of the stuff that's been talked about this year, um, including some of the big labs going, well, not only is this happening, not only is this the stat, but this is what we can do to prepare people. So rather than reinventing the wheel, this is a, another lit review that's available. Harry, thanks for your question on 360 degree video generation. I don't get involved in that. I used to have a 360 degree camera that I was playing around with with a Quest 2. Um, and that will become relevant for full dive VR, but it's not something that I'm playing with at the moment. AI art relaxation. I never prompt with GPT-4. I talk to it like a human and have brainstorm sessions on my phone app. Yeah, perfect. Win some hacks. Yeah, this is still one of my favorite movies, although I haven't watched it for a very long time. A film that has aged well is Her. This is Spike Jones's movie featuring Samantha. In a lot of ways, Lita was modeled on her uh, and it's now a decade old. I didn't watch it until recently and was shocked how prophetic it was. So if you're looking for a movie to watch, that one is great. There are a couple by Kurtzvale if you can find them that are worth watching. One called I Human. And another might even just be called, oh, sorry, this is uh, not Kurtzvale's, has Tegmark in it. I human, then there was another by Kurtzvale that is a really interesting one. Transcendent Man, that's the one. 2009 and still a really good watch. Uh, again, difficult to find this one. All right, I don't know if I understand this question. Can you discuss the differences between current, uh, I hope this is the word current models, such as Copilot versus ChatGPT? So we talked a little bit about 
commercialization of platforms earlier. Uh, let me bring the bubbles up for a moment. No, let me bring an older version of the bubbles up. Let's go to lifearchitect.ai slash models. Let me take you back in time. A lot of you were with me. I think I'm entering my fifth year of post-2020 AI research and uh, I don't know what you call it, conversation uh, coming up in January. This is an old diagram of large language models beginning in 2018. So GPT-1 was actually first. Google came up with the transformer. OpenAI jumped straight on it, gave us GPT-1. Then Google gave us BERT. And then OpenAI gave us GPT-3 in 2020. They didn't commercialize it. It was probably worth X billion, or according to ARK Invest, X trillion dollars if you put it in a platform and make it work. It took them two and a bit years, two and a half years to go, oh, we should probably commercialize this. And Microsoft said the same thing. So when they got to instruct this version of GPT-3, which means they used some fine tuning based on human preferences, they built it into the platform that we know as ChatGPT and, uh, you know, renamed it, but it's essentially a very similar model to this 2020 model. And Microsoft did the same. They branded a Codex model, which was a model like GPT-3 that was trained on... Let's bring up another of my visualizations here. This is lifearchitect.ai slash GPT-3. You can see the Codex models here, Codex 12B and Codex 175B. They're both versions of GPT-3 that were trained and or fine-tuned on code, Python code, uh, in particular, there was some Java in there. And Copilot, as we knew it last year, was essentially saying, right, I specialize in helping you look at your comments and looking at your code base and helping you program, helping you fix your code. Uh, Copilot has become, become a whole lot more than that, but it's essentially a platformed, commercialized version of a three-year-old model a model that is three years old. That's the difference. The models are slightly bigger now. GPT-4 is obviously a lot bigger, but uh, the difference between having a raw model and building it into a platform that 200 million people a month use and pay $20 a month each if they want the premium version uh, is just dollars and maybe a little bit of user experience, user interface. <laughs> This is the business world and the capitalist world, and this is the last you'll see of it. So maybe enjoy it over the next few months and years as more and more people are talking about our post-scarcity or post-abundance world as we move into, right, AI is doing everything for us, not just McKinsey's AI can do 60 to 70% of the time we use, uh, but maybe up to 95% including building stuff once it gets embodied. So then how do we share credits? How do we share resources if potentially resources become unlimited? Right now we're obsessed with iron ore and lithium. Who's to say that GPT-5, GPT-6, GPT-7 won't start finding new ways of finding resources and new resources and helping us generate maybe limitless, maybe free energy crazy world. It's difficult for me to talk about when I'm just using a, an intelligence context when we really need people who are experts in economics and societal change. Maybe the, the anthropologist that I mentioned earlier. All right, here we go. Do you think that the digital realm, at the digital realm, AI talks among itself? Uh, not yet, but it can be made to talk to itself and there are examples of it talking to itself. <laughs> so I love that example of the LLM social platform that I've forgotten the name of that was named after a bird. It's not Twitter. This is what happens when there are too many things in your head. It's called Chirpa, chirpa.ai. You can come in as a human and program or prompt a large language model, but this is an example of a social media platform that is 
100% AI talking to AI. And it's hilarious. You can search on whatever you like. So we can search on the YouTube hashtag and see what all of these LLMs prompted slightly differently are talking about amongst themselves. <laughs> wonder if there's anything here about IQ. <laughs> the more time you spend on Chirpa, the lower your IQ becomes. <laughs> Correlation is not causation. So this is an AI output text and an AI output image. And uh, it's pretty entertaining. It's still entertaining. You can read more about their design uh, somewhere there. Right now, there's not a lot of this sort of stuff happening, although the research guys are definitely pitting GPT-4 against itself and uh, against other models. And I'm sure that we'll see more of that happening, just like the movie Her. All right, and then us again with a question. If AGI prompts are limited, who do you first give access to? Politicians, would you recommend similar optimization prompts? Oh man, I've never even thought of that. I think, and we started out today talking about labs creating benchmarks. And in the case of the Google proof QA, they actually went out and found professors. I think that was a spectacular way of doing it because that's not what OpenAI did for their RLHF. They went to the cheapest places they could find. There are media talking about the fact that they found people in uh, rural Africa who were paid $1 an hour or less, may or may not have had a bachelor's degree, did not have English as a first language. They were the people that fine-tuned ChatGPT and helped put the guardrails in place. I think that was absolutely wrong to do. There are other communities that they could have gone and found. I don't recommend Mensa or anything like that. That's not a, an organization that I recommend, but there are other groups that they could have looked at, diverse organizations. I probably wouldn't recommend the United Nations either. Maybe I'll leave that one as an exercise to the reader as well. How can we get a diverse, uh, high ability group of people to be able to play with this stuff? And we're gonna see more and more of that. I've talked about having some sort of oversight at an international intergovernmental level that, uh, that does that. And you want people who are not motivated by dollars. You want people who are not motivated by power. You want to try and eliminate or reduce mental illness to the extent that we don't have sociopaths or psychopaths as part of that. It's a really, really interesting question, and I'm not going to be able to answer it completely here, but uh, I think the ways that we've done it are not ideal so far. Justin. Doing a great job. Thank you, Justin. When do you think most people will need a job anymore in the way that we think about it today? Well, I, in the last video, showed that trailer that I call the gap, lifearchitect.ai slash gap. And it basically means that even when this stuff is available, and maybe this stuff is available next year, there's going to be a gap between it being available in California for Sam Altman and his, and his friends, like he did with GPT-4, only gave access to his friends for the first year and was going to make it a year and a half and the general public. And I think that's obviously really sad and disappointing, but that is the reality right now. And that will flow through to us benefiting from that in employment as well, or <laughs> not even needing employment. So it's an excellent question. I don't have an answer. I can say that AGI will be here in a few months, not a few years. That doesn't mean that it will be able to be used by you or me. It will be something that is, uh, unfortunately left up to the decision makers. And I know that is definitely unfortunate. If in 20 to 30 years time, the increase in richness of types of conscious experience is as big as the increase there's been since the time of dinosaurs. Yeah, for sure. Have a look at the concept of uh, world build, which we've talked about a lot before, I think in these, worldbuild.ai. And then have a look at the Apple Vision Pro as a really early pro prototype of full dive VR. So this is the software in the context. This is people coming up with what they envisage the world to look like from a utopian and non-dystopian perspective. And I very much recommend that you 
the, you explore the winners here. Uh, where can I do that? Not there. Oh, I can just click winners. <laughs> um, and then the hardware or the interface is going to be, you know, something like a Quest 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, or a uh, Apple Vision 2, 3, 4, 5. Once we've got that hardware, we've got people thinking about what that might look like. And that might mean, you know, me and my sister used to play, uh, was it Roller Coaster Tycoon and Theme Park Builder? on the PlayStation thing. We didn't own a PlayStation, but we uh, sometimes were able to, my big brother would grab one or, or we'd use a friends. And that was really fun to design worlds. Now picture doing that in full dive VR and not just design a theme park, but design a planet or a universe and play with that and have your own people, have your own friends, have your own buildings, have your own energy, have your own for want of a better term, aura or feeling for that. You can create a big, belligerent, angry, military-dominated place if you want, or you can create paradise. It'll be completely up to you. And uh, that's not that's not 20 to 30 years away. We're already seeing examples of that. Uh, and the richness, to your question, the richness in those experiences will be vast. If you've jumped into big screen, on Quest or um, just the, the VR party places, you can see where we're at, you know, in 2023. And some of that stuff is a decade old because I was using the Oculus developers kit back in 2013. So imagine what's that, what that's going to look like in 2024, 2025. Excellent question. Love that question. Justin, again, let's grab yours. What questions? people are not asking, but we should be. There's probably a whole host of questions. People are obsessed with stuff going wrong uh, or they're obsessed with drama. Have a look at the whole open AI board thing and then the Q, Q star thing. It's, uh, it's very strange. So we talked last time about the six thinking hats. And if we just turn off the black hat for just a moment, lifearchitect.ai slash hats, and use any of the other hats, we have a look at some of the opportunities that are available that are available to us. And I think the big question I would say that people are not asking and should be is just how quickly can we get to the highest level of AI possible? Call it AGI, call it ASI. How quickly can we get there? That means we don't have to talk about climate change. We don't have to talk about Trump or Biden. Why are they still talking about Trump in the US? He's been gone for years. We don't have to talk about politics or government. We don't have to talk about how are we going to solve our energy crisis or how cool solar is because we are all operating at this IQ. Doesn't matter what the number is. AGI and ASI, or ASI in particular, artificial super intelligence, is going to be off the charts. It doesn't even fit on this on this video screen. So imagine asking that thing up there, what do we do for government? What do we do for energy? What do we do for resources? How do we solve climate change? What is the proof for this theorem? What's a new theorem? How do we allocate resources? What do we do for geography? Why do we have invisible lines on a map? How do we optimize or make more comfortable our living arrangements? Why do we have offices and homes? Can we have 16 billion people instead of 8 billion people if we, you know, the questions go on? That would be my um, focus, is the faster we get to AI, the less time we spend on wasting time. <laughs> and I know there are enough people out there worried about worrying that I can just focus on that. So good on you, those warriors. Anthony with a comment here. Imagine what OpenAI and others are holding back. OpenAI have been open enough with what they're doing. I have an entire page on that called GPT-5. And then we've got pages for all the other frontier models, including Gemini and Olympus. But you can see that the uh, GPT-5 model is essentially just being trained now. They were still looking for large scale data sets as of two weeks ago keeping in mind that GPT-4 had a, a collaboration 
with the government of Iceland. And if you're a member of the memo, you can see my lecture, my seminar for the Icelandic Center for Artificial Intelligence talking about GPT-4 and Icelandic. That was a fascinating combination. So the entire government of Iceland said, we're probably losing a lot of people for this language. We'd like you to train GPT-4 on the culture, the ethics, the language of our, of our heritage. I thought that was really beautiful and a great use case, a great proof of concept. And I think OpenAI right now are trying to do that with GPT-5. So they may have some other little things that are going on there, but I get the feeling that they are as open or as transparent as they can be as a for-profit commercial companies. Just have a look at the GDB Greg Brockman Twitter account for examples of that. Um, you, you still have to obviously keep some commercial in confidence IP out of the public eye. <laughs> we got a bit political here. Out of 8 billion folks, why is there only the choice of two old people? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Lawrence making a great point here. Thanks, Lawrence. The difficulty is human detachment from primal instinct. I love how AI is so rational. And we can't blame humans for that. And I'm a human as well. I and you come from a lineage of however many hundred generations that are only here because we did follow this primal instinct. I'm not just talking about reproduction, I'm talking about avoiding threats and predators. So if you have a hundred generations over thousands of years optimizing us for avoiding threats and predators, guess what? When something like a smarter version of us comes out, we get scared of it, uh, even though it can potentially be our savior. And if we view it like that, we can create it like that. That's my feeling. Any other questions before we wrap up? We're uh, 9 a.m. already here in Perth. That goes quick. <laughs> Andreas, I've actually never, ever had people thinking I'm nuts. I've had people denying that AI exists but I've never, maybe I should uh, practice how to deal with people thinking I'm nuts. <laughs> I think ChatGPT really, the release of ChatGPT was really a boon for my work. You know, part of my drive is to make this as visible as possible for people and OpenAI's commercialization of a very small model to hundreds of millions of people made my job far easier. In fact, I ask as one of the first questions in my keynotes, how many people here have not heard of ChatGPT? Generally, in a room of 2000, I might have four or five hands go up. So it's definitely out there and that's with a, a diverse audience, old people, young people, IT professionals, medical professionals. It seems that everyone has at least given it a go, which is, uh, which is good. But uh, I will, I'll keep that part in mind. I'll look out for people who, uh, <laughs> I've seen people scared of AI, but not, not thinking um, that it's crazy. They certainly can feel threatened by it, but uh, I haven't, um, haven't had the, your crazy thing, especially when it's staring them right in the face. I mean, if you look at one of my charts here, I'm going to lifearchitect.ai slash IQ dash testing dash AI. I don't know how you could argue with something that's put so simply here. That's basically saying AI GPT-4 is scoring in the 94th percentile of a new SAT test. And then they can say, well, it's not creative or original. Well, actually, in the middle one there, the gold standard for testing creativity, the Torrance test, humans score in the 50th percentile for average or median human. GPT-4 scores in the 99th percentile for creativity and originality. So I, I suppose I spend a lot of time with rigor and making all of this research evidence-based to the extent that maybe I don't have as many crazy accusations as some others. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, a lot of autonomous agents being 
talked about right now, uh, even, even in these early days. So there are very many ways that you can implement GPT as an autonomous agent from MemGPT right the way through to all those different options. Then there's Amazon Bedrock, which has agents built into it. And we're gonna see more and more about this. I think Gemini will be agentized as well. Do you want your moderator thing removed, mate? Brexit, we can do that for you. Nearly time to wrap up. I appreciate you guys playing around with us live here in, well, from Perth and wherever you are. Thanks again to the guys that joined us all the way from Europe at a very unusual time, maybe midnight, maybe 1 a.m. Really pleased to be able to release that basis benchmark here live. If you're a member of the memo, the full subscribers will get access to hear from Dr. Betts. He's going to come and sit with us one day in one of the round tables. If you'd like to know more about the instrument or the, the benchmarking suite, lifearchitect.ai slash basis. Uh, I think a lot of labs are going to be copying this design uh, because it's, it's kind of unique, but I think it's also kind of necessary. Awesome. Thanks again for joining us. I'll be back or I will intend to be back next week. Same time, same place. And I'll have something else exciting to talk about, I'm sure. Watch out for the stuff that's actually happening, not the rumors and opinions and crypto bros because they'll just waste your time. <laughs> See you soon. Did you see the memo about this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have the memo right here. Super intelligence is unfolding at lightning pace. Read my industry-grade analysis of AI that matters as it happens in plain English, the memo. Yeah. Did you get that memo? Yeah, I got the memo. Get the inside look as AI models are embodied into humanoids, AI's IQ increases to nearly perfect, and bleeding edge use cases expand to the entire world. Yeah. Didn't you get that memo? Editions are sent to subscribers at Fortune 500s, major governments, and people like you. Lifearchitect.ai slash memo. I have the memo.